Commercial Production and Potential Crops for Urban Agriculture, Unit 4. Crops, Plants or Animals. The two major categories of crops are plants and animals, though we don't usually tend to think of animals as crops. But for the purposes of this unit, we're going to be looking at various plant crops. So we tend to think of plant crops as either vegetable or fruit, but there are more divisions used for practical definitions of the types of plant crops. We will divide the various plant crops into a few main groups, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and grains. Vegetable crops. Vegetable crops include leaf crops like lettuce, spinach, or other greens such as mustard, turnip, collard, and kale. Um, roots or tubers, potatoes, onions, carrots, beets, turnips, radishes, jicama, rutabaga, and more. Legumes, beans and peas, or fruit vegetables. Tomatoes and peppers are actually fruits of the tomato and pepper plants though we tend to lump them with vegetables. And then there are herbs and spices, basil, thyme, rosemary, oregano, mints, that sort of thing. Of course, this list doesn't include all of the things we use as vegetables, but is meant as a way of thinking about the different types. Here's a photograph of some bean plants, and you can see the beans in the man's hand um, growing in pods that's typical of legumes, beans and peas and that sort of thing. Here's a tomato plant growing in a garden surrounded by this tomato basket which helps hold the plant upright and keep the weight of the fruits from pulling the plant down to the ground. Fruit crops. There are many crops we traditionally think of as fruits. The poem crops which include apples and pears. The uh, citrus fruits, lemons, limes, oranges, grapefruits, that sort of thing. Stone fruits, peaches, plums, cherries, those things with a single large seed inside. Melons like watermelons, cantaloupe, muskmelon, cassava, and more. And berries, blueberries, raspberry, blackberry, mulberry, gooseberry, again, um, this list isn't all inclusive, but it gives you an idea of the range and to some extent the size of fruiting plants. Um, the palm crops and citrus crops, stone fruit, tend to be trees. The melons are vines. The berries typically um, shrubs though mulberries uh, can be quite large trees. Here's a photograph of an apple orchard. Typically in an orchard situation like this, you'll have sections of the orchard containing different varieties of apple trees, um, rather than the entire orchard being red delicious, they'll divide them up and you have Gala and Fuji and that sort of thing um, for a number of reasons. One, different apples ripen at different times. Two, uh, fertilization of some varieties um, results in better tasting fruit if the fertilization comes from a neighboring variety or a different variety. Um, and also if a disease or problem hits one specific variety, it may not attack the others and there still may be production. Nut crops, another potential type of crop includes the nuts. We, we often don't think of nuts uh, as a potential agricultural thing, but of course they are. They're typically grown on trees and shrubs, and they include things like hazelnuts, which are shrubby trees, walnuts, pecans, which can be huge trees, almonds, sort of a middle-sized tree, Brazil nuts, and, and more. Um, we often include peanuts, in the group of nuts, but they're actually an annual plant, uh, a legume, rather than a tree or a shrub. And the peanut itself is actually produced below ground. 
So they're not really nuts, though we include them in that group of plants. Also, peanuts require quite warm temperatures uh, to go through an entire cycle and produce fruit. This is a photograph of a hazelnut shrub. Um, what we're looking at here is something in the neighborhood of uh, eight feet tall. Uh, they can be anywhere from a couple of feet tall to, to 20 feet or more. Um, but for the purposes of harvest, they're generally kept rather small. Grain crops. Well, grains or cereals include virtually all the grasses used by humans for food. Some of them include corn, wheat, rye, barley, millet, and sorghum. And though it's actually a legume and not a grass at all, soybeans are often included in lists of grains because once they're harvested, they're treated essentially like grains. They're stored like grains, transported like grains, um, often ground up uh, like grains. But again, this isn't a complete list. Around the world, humans use many different varieties of grasses uh, as food. Here we see three different cereal crops uh, grown next to each other in a field. Um, the low stubble in the foreground was either wheat or barley. Kind of hard to identify now, it's just the stubble left. The uh, mid-sized plant, the next uh, row there that you can see, is sorghum. And behind that is corn or maize. So we've seen some of the potential crops, the typical things that are grown, but there are many, many more. The next thing to look at, if you're thinking about producing things, and particularly commercially and making profit at it, um, are the requirements of the crops. Now, just about any plant can be grown as a crop in urban agriculture if you can provide the main requirements, which are climate, soil, and sun. So climate is important in choosing crops. Some crops require cooler climates, some require warmer or even tropical climates. For instance, you wouldn't plant an orange grove in Minneapolis. However, sometimes it's possible to grow a crop that normally requires warmer climate. Because in an urban situation, urban areas are heat islands and can often be a full USD climate zone warmer than the surrounding countryside. You may also have the moderating effects of large bodies of water. So you can go far north, but if you're very close to the ocean or one of the Great Lakes, temperatures in the winter tend to be a little warmer, so you get a climate zone or more uh, boost there. Um, soil is incredibly important to almost any plant as a source of nutrients, water, and support, simply to hold it up. The good thing about soil is it can be amended and improved in quality. So even though you may be starting with poor soil, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't produce crops and that you can't improve that soil and produce better crops each year. Finally, sun. It's a source of energy for photosynthesis for all plants, all green plants. And many crops won't do well without several hours of full sun every day. Um, there's also another important aspect to sunlight that we'll discuss uh, in the next slide, which is called photoperiod. And finally, space. Some crops simply require more room than others. If you have a small strip of land available for urban agriculture, you might not decide to plant a pecan grove there. Uh, smaller vegetable crops are probably a better choice. Okay, what is this thing about photoperiod? Well, photoperiodism 
is the reaction of an organism to varying amounts of light, particularly the varying length of day through the seasons. What plants actually measure, though, is the length of night rather than the length of day. Um, they contain a, a chemical that, when exposed to bright light, changes almost instantly from one form, we can call it nighttime form, to daytime form. Then, when the light goes away, the chemical changes back to the nighttime form very slowly. So when, it's, when a plant is exposed to bright light, this chemical almost instantly changes to daytime form. Then when it's exposed to darkness, it slowly changes back to the nighttime form. The plant can measure the percentage of the nighttime form of this chemical, or it knows when all of it has turned to nighttime form. So it's measuring the length of night rather than the length of day. Many plants will not flower if the days are too short or too long. And many plants won't flower if the days don't progressively get longer or progressively get shorter. In most agriculture, this isn't an issue because we plant crops suited to our climate and to our growing season. But in urban agriculture, this could be an issue in some cases. Some plants will only flower as days begin to get shorter and bright lights, such as street lights, can sometimes disrupt the plant's ability to accurately measure the length of darkness and could potentially prevent some plants from flowering. Now, there have been documented cases, for instance, of uh, production of uh, ornamental plants, such as chrysanthemums, which flower as the days get shorter, um, of their flowering being disrupted because lights were turned on in a greenhouse at night, and it changed the uh, chemical makeup, and they decided that the days weren't getting shorter, and so the plants didn't flower. It's a possibility. So something we need to be aware of um, when we look at things like location. Some other factors in your choice of crops, in addition to providing a proper climate, soil, and sunlight, as well as enough space, there are other factors that enter into our choice of crops for agriculture. Um, probably first and foremost should be insect and disease resistant. If an area has a problem with certain insects or diseases, you should take care to choose disease and insect resistant varieties of plants. Even if the problem doesn't exist there, I think that this is one of the biggest concerns. Um, for instance, there are varieties of fruits such as apples or pears that are extremely susceptible to diseases such as fire blight. Um, and it'll affect the overall quality of the fruit that you get and the quantity of fruit you get. Um, there are varieties of those fruits which are very resistant to fire blight, and those should be the ones that we choose. Um, next, fertility requirements. If we're planning a closed loop system that won't use external inputs for fertilizer, then crops should be chosen that have fertility requirements that match what we have available to give them. Um, it's also important when you're starting on poor soil. As the soil is improved, maybe you can make different crop choices and grow things that require uh, higher fertility in the soil. And finally, companion plants. Some plants complement each other and grow well together. For instance, planting legumes, beans and peas, along with corn helps prevent the corn from depleting the nitrogen from the soil. In addition, the corn can provide support for the legumes, many of which are climbing plants that will climb up the, the corn pan. Now, you can see, obviously, that this method of mixing these two crops wouldn't work well in a situation where uh, large machines like combines are used for harvesting. However, in a... Uh, smaller scale setting, 
where a human walks down the row and picks the ears of corn that are ripe and picks the, uh, the beans or peas or whatever that are ready for harvesting uh, by hand, this kind of system can work really well. Another crop choice factor, maybe one of the very most important factors, your market. If your goal is commercial production, then choosing crops that people want is a very important choice factor. And this is an area where urban agriculture can excel. Local customers might want certain foods that aren't typically available in grocery stores because of cultural or regional tastes. Urban agriculture is in a great position to recognize and meet those needs with the potential of greater profits by supplying a rare commodity. Commercial production. Commercial production implies making a profit and increasingly urban agriculture is doing just that. One of the videos assigned in the previous unit shows an urban farm producing 6,000 pounds of food on a one quarter acre lot, providing food for a family and additional income of about $20,000 per year. That's on a quarter acre lot. So commercial production in urban agriculture even in a small scale, is possible and can be profitable. Finally, alternative crops. You know, we've looked at vegetables, and that's primarily what we think of when we think of agriculture and urban agriculture. Um, but there are alternative crops suitable for urban agriculture, primarily the ornamental plant crops. Crops that fall under the umbrella of ornamental are extremely varied and range from flowers to trees and everything in between. Some straddle the line between ornamental and edible. Growing such crops is still agriculture, of course, and when grown in urban environments, it's still urban agriculture. As an example, a great part of the cost of buying a new tree or a shrub for your yard is transportation. If these are grown 50 miles away out in the country on huge nurseries, then they have to be dug up, put on a truck, trucked into the city or the, the urban location, stored for a while before they're sold, sold and then planted, that transportation and storage thing can add a great deal of cost. Um, so growing such plants close to the ultimate market makes a lot of sense. Um, and there is an operation called uh, Nance Farms in Detroit that is attempting to do just that. So if you're interested in that possibility, um, it might be worth Googling. Um, I believe it's Hans Farms and see uh, their business model and how they're planning on growing uh, nurseries within the urban limits of Detroit. Okay, that concludes this unit.